before I start, I'd like to thank my wonderful editors, Sam and Allison, for helping me with this paper. Um, so, my paper today is What Dress Reveals the Connections Between the Fetiales and Sacrifice to Fides Through Ritual Garments. Warfare was a constant among the archaic communities of Central Italy, which spurred the development of mechanisms for diplomatic negotiation. Among the Latins, and perhaps other peoples, these diplomatic agents, who became known as fetiales, were religious figures. From among them, the pater patratus, a man designated as a symbolic father for negotiating on behalf of his country, was chosen. Livy, in Book One of Alphabe Condita, describes the founding of the fetiales and the cult of fides, which was also linked to diplomacy. This description includes an overview of the ritual clothing of both groups. This ritual clothing can help us analyze the nature of these diplomatic religious groups, showing that the fetiales were essential an element of the military and can be identified as an institution particular to the Latin people. The sacrifice to fides, which Numa Pompilius established, was closely linked to the fetiales, partially by the group's dress, and acted as a mnemonic device for them. Religious figures in the ancient world were almost universally visually marked out from the rest of the community by clothing or by ritual items they carried, at least for the duration of the religious duties under their charge. Communities often buried their deceased priests with these items or depicted them with them in funerary art, as these objects symbolized their exalted positions in the community. Many uh, ancient Greco-Roman historians and antiquarians were interested in dress although they tend to be frustratingly vague about the details uh, of the actual appearance of the garments. This includes Livy, whose first book contains several passages discussing specialized clothing, the motives for such customs, and their origins, as is appropriate for his interest in quae vita qui mores fuerit, what their lives were like, what the customs were. However, he is largely only interested in the symbolism of these garments, necessitating recourse to material sources for more exact to information, which will be discussed later in this talk. In book one of his Ab Urbe Convita, Livy describes the creation, ritual, and dress of the fetiales in some detail. He states that Ancus Marcius instituted the college so that the Romans would be able to incorporate religious practice into war as they did peace. Presumably, the implication is that this would allow the Romans to wage war justly and lawfully. Livy's attribution for the importation to Ancus creates some confusion with the in the text, however, since in an earlier episode, a priest called Fetialis uses a similar ritual to negotiate with Alba prior to the fight between the Curati and the Horati. This perhaps indicates that Ancus's contribution constitutes an enlargement of formalization of previously established Roman diplomatic practice rather than the introduction of an entirely new ritual. The first ritual that Livy describes is one of treaty making, wherein the Fetialis receives authorization from the king, Tullus Hostilius, to make a treaty with the Albans. He is granted it by the token of the Sagmina, the sacred herbs, which he then uses to ritually designate the Pater Patratus. The Pater Patratus, in turn, calls upon Jupiter as a witness to the terms of the treaty before sacrificing a pig using a silex, a flint stone. The formulas used are all written in archaic language. The pater patratus is a figure who takes this role of the pater familias for the entire community in negotiations with another community, as patres familiares could in disputes between families. Thus, the pater patratus have the power to demand restitution for damages his family <coughs> had suffered, and he could hand a dependent over to the other party as payment. The second, a more famous ritual is a declaration of war, the, where the fetiales goes to the border of the people with whom there has been a dispute, the, calls upon Jupiter and announces his identity, voices the complaints the Romans have against this people, and announces that they have 33 days in which to rectify them to prevent a declaration of war. As he progresses into enemy territory, he repeats this procedure to the first man he meets, upon entering the city gates and in the forum. Once the 33 days have elapsed, the fetialis, 
now calling himself Pater Patratos, consults the king and senate, reminding them that the demands have not been met and therefore war cannot be declared. After a vote is held, the Fetialis takes a hastam ferratram of priustum sanguinium, a spear covered in iron or blood red, hardened by burning, and having formally declared war in the presence of three adult men, throws his spear into enemy territory. In this ritual, only the cult consultation with the Senate contains archaic language. Livy's description of the Fetio ritual includes a brief note on their dress. He says that they were capite velato filo, lanae velamen est, with his head covered by a fillet, the covering is of wool, and carried a hastam ferratam ut praeustam sanguineam, which I just translated above, which they used to declare war. Unfortunately, other authors uh, tend to be even less specific, with Dionysus is of Halicarnassus merely calling the whole ensemble Estheticae Foreisimasin Hierois with sacred clothing and insignia. The caput velatum, the head cover, is a standard feature of Roman and to some extent italic priestly dress, while the spear is the mark of the warrior. The role of warrior priest was common for elite Etruscan men and indeed for later Romans amongst whom an upper-class man might commonly be both a general and a priest. In fact, male elite Etruscan burials frequently include grave books that mark them as both warriors and religious leaders, suggesting that clothing and accessories which first served a military purpose became ritualized as priestly symbols. One such example is the litos, a curved staff which, due to its distinctive shape, is often used to identify priests in artwork. Originally, however, the lito seems to have been a trumpet, the military significance of which is obvious, while its religious importance can be derived from its fine spot in a sacred context. Over time, its religious use must have become ritualized to the point that the original use was forgotten and the trumpet was substituted with a staff in the same shape. Given the intimate connections between warriors and priests in Etruria and Rome, to the extent that even quite unwarlike religious items were ultimately derived from military equipment, the Fetialis' role should not be seen as one of peaceful diplomacy. They were a part of the military. The Fetialis, after all, carried actual spears and were likely combat combatants themselves in early periods. To uh, return to the first element of the Fetialis dress Livy mentions, it's necessary to ask what sort of garments Livy is actually referring to when he says that the Fetialis were capite velato filo, lanae velamen est. Caput velatum indicates that the Fetialis drew a fold of their uh, clothing over their heads, as was regular practice for Romans while performing sacred rituals. While a study of votive heads showed that covering the head during religious practice was known to the Etruscans and other Italic peoples, it was concentrated among the Latins, suggesting that this was a particularly Latin practice in the regal and republican eras. They may have been wearing the quinctus gabinus, a form of the toga that was tied so as to allow greater mobility of the left arm than the ordinary toga, and so had military connotations. Whether or not this style had a military origin, it was adopted for a variety of religious observances, which were often associated in some way with wars, such as the opening of the doors of the Temple of Janus, with a full of the toga pulled over the head. By historical times, wearing the quintus gabinus effectively meant the wearer was capite velato. The name of this style, gabinus, from the Latin town of Gabi, suggests that the Romans viewed it as adopted from that town, and therefore a particularly Latin style. This Latin origin makes it a particularly apt garment for the Fetialis, who appear to be a Latin institution. A denarius minted in 16 BC by Gaius Antistius Wetos, see handout number one, it shows a scene of two capite velato men wearing the king Gabinus, holding a piglet over an altar with a legend reading, Foiders Populi Romani cum Gabi. A treaty of the Roman people with the people of Gabi. 
This is strong evidence for the Fetiawa is wearing the Quintus Gabinus. Solshan's suggestion that these men are wearing the Lemus, a skirt-like apron used for sacrifices, does not seem at all probable from the image. As a general suggestion the, for the clothing of the Fetiales, it does not provide a means to cover the head, which Livy clearly specifies. A gold statuary coin from the late 3rd century BCE, however, which you, you can see at handout number 2, who it shows uh, the ritual conclusion of a treaty by two men, the left hand one holding a sword and a spear, and the right hand one a spear alone. Yeah. This suggests that the Fetiales were not always required to wear the Quintus Gabinus, although they seem to have done so by the day. The right hand man clearly wears military dress, but the exact nature of the left hand figure's clothing is debated. Richardson argues for the trabea, essentially a purple or purple striped cloak, wound around his waist and perhaps brought over the shoulder. Zolshan suggests, largely on the basis of evidence from Servius and Virgil, that the Fetiales, or at least the Pater Petratus, might have worn the limos. While her overall paper has some methodological flaws, the skirt-like limos does appear more similar to the garment as it appears on this second coin than the, the trabea. It should be noted that these figures may be generic oath takers rather than a scene actually involving a fetialis. Ultimately, the necessity for the head covering may depend on the type of ritual they were performing or may have varied through the centuries. That the priestly figure kills the piglet using a sword rather than a silex, a flintstone, need not disqualify him as a fetialis, despite the fact that Livy specifies a silex as the weapon. This ignores that the Fetiales are inherently military and assumes that, that Livy's Augustan era account of a supposedly archaic scene is accurate to the 3rd century BCE. Livy wrote in a period when archaizing religion was the fashion, uh, and uh, so it's quite possible that the Fetiales of the 3rd century BCE used a sword, but that those of Livy's day used a silex in order to appear authentically ancient and traditional. The Denarius of 16 BCE provides more secure evidence for the Fetiales under Augustus, who were clearly capite velato, and that Livy believed that this had been the case from archaic sometimes seemed as a safe assumption. The other feature of the Fetiales' dress set that Livy specifies is the philo. This is an extremely vague word, simply meaning a thread or fabric of some sort, with a technical meaning of a fillet worn by priests. The philom seems to have been worn in conjunction with other priestly headgear, generally apex, as a method of attaching the spike of the apex to the hat and or the head, hat to the head, but never by itself. And thus, Libby's statement that the fetiales wear the philom suggests uh, that they also wear the apex or something very similar. The apex was, like the Quintus Gabinus, originally a military garment, its shape originating with an Etruscan helmet. Images of Etruscan priests show them wearing similar hats. If the Fetiales did indeed wear the apex, this would further solidify the theory that the Fetiales were military personnel. While the spike of the apex could perhaps make it difficult for the Fetiales to cover their heads with their togas, since the apex was the priestly hat, it must have been possible, perhaps by using the felum to secure the fabric. The final element that Libby mentions is that the veil in Wilamen must be made of wool. Well, Libby is not the only writer to discuss the materials from which the Fetiales' clothing must be made. Servius specifies that the Fetiales never wear linen due to fears that it will weaken the tree. Thus, we have ample confirmation that the Fetiales' veil is woolen, which is unsurprising as a costume for a religious figure with origins in early Latium, where wool was the main fiber. It's also necessary to consider Thomas Wiedemann's argument that the Fetiales war declaration ritual was actually an Augustan invention, which historians of his era, primarily Livy, he had then attributed backwards to archaic Rome. In addition to this quite convincing argument, I note the parallels between Ancus Marcius, to whom Livy attributes the establishment of the Fetiales, and Augustus. <laughs> Livy describes Ancus as medium erat in anco ingenium, et numai et romami memor. 
a king who was re both religious and successful of, in war, reminiscent of both Numa uh, and Romulus, whose accession was related to his descent from a prior Roman ruler, Numa. Similarly, Augustus presented himself as both victorious over his enemies and deeply concerned with proper religious procedure, listing the number of temples he had built or restored in his race gestae. Like Livy suggests Ancus did with Numa, Augustus gained power through his relationship to his predecessor, Julius Caesar. Thus, Ancus is an extremely suitable figure for Livy to attribute an Augustan invention to. This also explains the discrepancy between the Tullus Hostilius using a, a ritual that distinctly belonged to the Fetiales and that <coughs> ritual being established by his successor, uh, since Ancus is a convenient founder figure rather than an actual importer of the role. Although it is doubtful that the spear throwing rite is archaic, Fetiales do seem to have been involved in diplomatic negotiations from an early date. Indeed, the lack of evidence for the actual ritual all and formula as Livy presents them does not include that the spear could have been carried as a symbol by the Fetiales prior to Augustus. The numismatic evidence mentioned above uh, from, uh, the, from the, the late 3rd century BC shows uh, both men with spears, and uh, both uh, coins show two men engaged in sacrificing a pig, as in Livy's account of Tullus Hostilius' treaty with Alba Longa. If the spear throwing rite is an Augustan invention, it was well grounded in earlier uh, custom. Additionally, its exact date of origin actually has little bearing on the discussion of Fetiale's dress in Livy's first book. The other diplomacy-related ritual whose establishment Livy relates is that of the sacrifices to Fides, which Numa Pompilius established. Livy's only description of this solemn ritual is the priest's transportation to the site and their clothing. Where the site is actually located appears to Livy to be too obvious to mention, uh, but it is possible that he is discussing the Temple of Fides on the Capitoline, where Scipio Nasca would later famously hold a Senate meeting before the assassination of Tiberius Gracchus. So Livy says that Numa, ad id sacrarium flamine spigis curu arcu ato where he used manu qua ad digitos usque in voluta. He ordered that the flamines be conveyed to the sanctuary in a covered two-horse chariot, and that their hands be covered all the way to their fingers. The Flamines' accoutrements for the sacrifice show a remarkable emphasis on covering beyond the capitivilato, which is not specified here. This can be assumed, though, as Livy gives no indication that the sacrifice was not carried out according to the Ritus Romanus. Covered carriages were well known by Livy's time, if not Numa's, and were used in religious contexts such as by the Vestal Virgins. The hand covering, to which Livy, Livy attributes more significance, appear to be unique and so are intriguing. Manuque ad digitos usque in voluta suggests perhaps a fingerless glove, but such a garment has not been documented. The description could also fit long sleeves that cover the hand or a piece of cloth wrapped around the hand and perhaps the arm. The last option seems to fit best, as it would not be at odds with traditional Roman priestly dress, as long sleeves would be, and involuta indicates a sense of wrapping. Livy says that Numa ordered this hand covering to signify that fidem tutam dam sedem qua eos etiam in dextri sacratum esse that faith should be guarded and her seat made sacred even in their right hands. Apparently, the covering is a mnemonic device so that the priests remember the importance of the deity and virtue to whom they are sacrificing. Livy also specifies that fide should be in dextri sacratum, which suggests both that the covering is placed on the right hand and that the sacrifice and the mnemonic device are linked to the practice of dextra data. Dextra data, a handshake, it was the Roman method of confirming a treaty or agreement, much as it is today. 
and as such was an assurance of faith and honesty. If the sacrifices to Fides are bound up with the keeping of agreements, it seems sensible for her call to place a mnemonic device upon the hand used for confirming such agreements and for this practice to be important for her cult. Making determinations as to whether the parties of an agreement had remained faithful to it was, of course, the, the duty of the fetiales. As the interests of the sacrifice to Fides concerning faith and agreements probably covered personal agreements, we have reason to believe that they could also apply to the inter-community agreements that involve the fetiales. Given this, it is tempting to hypothesize that the flabnes of the Fides cult might have been at least some of the same individuals as the fetiales. While evidence to show this conclusively is lacking, such an arrangement would set light on the purpose of the cult and why Roman authors feel such a deep connection between it and the fetiales, yet do not explain the link. Judging by the way Livy explains the sacrifices to Fides, they were essentially a mnemonic tool designed to remind worshippers that Fidem Tutanda, the faith must be guarded. The dextrice in the Livy's formula can be taken as a reference to dextrodata, the shaking of hands, which was used to conclude treaties, as Livy describes when Aeneas and Latinus make a treaty. Since the fetiales were in charge of ensuring that Rome adhered to treaties and determining whether Rome or the other party had broken them, a cult that serves to remind the fetiales of the importance of fides by having them sacrificed to her in a mnemonic ritual would be sensible. And additionally, as a flamen, the priest of the ritual would wear the apex and cover his head, the same attire I have suggested for the fetiales. A priest being <coughs> capite velato might, like many of the elements of the fetiales, his clothing, have had military connotations, actually, as Appian says that Nasica's covering of his head before leaving the Temple of Fides could be interpreted as representing a helmet. It should be noted that Livy, according to his own chronology, attributes the establishment of the annual sacrifice to Numa approximately 70 to 30 years prior to Ancus' establishment of the Fetialis. However, as we have already established, Livy shows the actions of the Fetialis under Tullus while giving no indication that Tullus was establishing a new procedure. Thus, while the placement of the establishment of the cult of Fides prior to that of the Fetialis could suggest that the latter evolved out of the former, Livy's chronology is not necessarily significant. From the ritual clothing, the fetiales and the flamines of Fides wear, the fetiales can be identified as a priesthood deeply linked to the military and supported by the cult of Fides. The sources on treaty making in the fetiales differ as to the governments, but this can be attributed to ritual changes over time, or perhaps sources depicting different stages of the ritual. Livy's description can be assumed to be correct for his own era, but Etruscan sources, more contemporary to the period Livy is writing about, must be consulted to gain a better understanding of the archaic equivalents and their possible significance in that period. Even if Livy's account only reflects a ritual constructed in his own period, the interest in archaic history during the Augustan era means that to Augustan ideas of the fetiales are rooted in an understanding of older practices, and so the symbolism of these garments may have resonance in the regal period. Thank you. Going back to the Thomas Wyman Wiedemann's argument, um, I haven't really thought of like any reasons why uh, Livy might have like presented this as um, a, like a tradition rooted in Ancus Marcus versus like an Augustan um, revitalization. Um, so what? So there is the idea that Augustus may have revitalized things, but you can't really revitalize something that never existed. That, um, and so Livy's very much a pro-Augustus historian, and he's interested in supporting Augustus's religious propaganda. And uh, so, giving this history of um, 
how it was in ancient times when things were good before all the corruption and Greekness came in. <laughs> um, but may help strengthen Augustus' position as going, look, I revitalized this thing. We're going back to the ancient grandeur. Does that answer yeah, your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a related question. I was wondering if there is this revival of um, what they felt to be archaic practice. What would the sources have been for their idea of what those practices were? Um, you can find a few different things. Mostly Augustus claimed to have dug up old records at temples. So he'll say that he you know, found this hide with this inscription telling him to do things in this temple, or um, that the sublime book said something, or there's this coat of armor somewhere with a little inscription on it. Uh, of course, there's almost very few people can access these uh, things that Augustus is supposedly looking at that tell you how to do things properly. and. Uh, pretty much everyone who can access them is an Augustan supporter, so we don't actually know whether any of these things Augustus purports to have looked at existed, or what they really said. Toby? Um, I think you said <clears throat> it was convincing, it was a convincing argument that, uh, that, that this ritual was just constructed in the ritual. Are you willing to take a stand on the side? And what, 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 what do you think is more likely? So I started reading that article going, this is going to be complete nonsense. Of course it's older. It's actually a very convincing article. So given that we do not have any early, we don't have any earlier evidence for um, the spear throwing ritual, except in historians like Libby, um, no, all the numismatic evidence uh, it only shows the sacrifices. And uh, Augustus was particularly interested in making the, you know, his declaration of war seem just. So I would tend to say that in the absence of earlier evidence, it does seem quite likely that Augustus invented the spear throwing ritual from a combination of uh, older practices. I was wondering, is there any, was there any like small meaning of covering the head in relation to trust? Um, I haven't found any. It seems to be a general sort of Latin Roman tradition to cover the head as a sign of respect to the gods. Um, and so I suppose you could say that, you know, the gods don't like people being untrustworthy. There doesn't seem to be that that seems to be a more general marker of a religious figure engaged in a religious ritual than a specific marker of trust, but it would be very interesting if there were those kinds of connotations. If there's no more questions, then 